So I'd like to start by reiterating a point that Chris Rowe made in, in this morning session that we've, across the course of a week, we've heard lots about theory. And we think it's really important that we collect and use data to evaluate and discern between those theories. Uh, so what I'm presenting here today is a series of ongoing studies testing uh, one theory we've heard about, which is Rupert Sheldrake's theory of morphic resonance. So in terms of the background of the theory, uh, morphic fields were first proposed by Gerwitz in the 1920s to account for explanatory gaps in the ontogeny of species. In other words, trying to account for how uh, certain species develop from a single undifferentiated cell into complex organisms with multiple specialized cells. So it's considered among many that epigenetics or gene expression is insufficient to account for that, how that happens. Uh, so a field theory, a morphic field theory was proposed to try and explain that. Sheldrake built upon Goetz's initial ideas, suggesting this effect occurs by resonance, uh, in turn producing what he refers to as invisible blueprints. These blueprints influence the probabilities or weightings by which certain outcomes occur uh, and produce some kind of a collective intraspecies record. Uh, he suggests these exist in nested hierarchies, ranging from the microscopic at the cellular level through to the macroscopic, uh, to explain psychological effects, uh, which is what I'm interested in talking about here today. In terms of evidence for the theory, Sheldrake cites numerous sources ranging from field investigations, looking at species learning and how members of species uh, isolated from each other seem to learn things almost at exactly the same time, despite not having migration paths to explain learning by imitation. Uh, and animal studies in, in under more controlled conditions in laboratories using behaviorist paradigms um, with uh, the control animals unexpectedly showing hereditary effects or effects which would normally be explained by hereditary means despite being isolated from animals in, in learning paradigms. In the human realm, Sheldrake cites his own evidence in support of morphic resonance um, from two main sources, one involving uh, problem or puzzle solving, uh, and the main one of interest to me is in terms of language learning. So he conducted one study where children were learning uh, Japanese nursery rhymes, either traditional ones or novel ones that were produced for the study. And the finding was that the traditional rhymes were, were, were acquired uh, remembered better than, than the novel ones. So the explanation here is that uh, the morphogenetic or the morphic field um, that's been um, generated and rehearsed with the traditional nursery rhymes explains why uh, children can learn the traditional nursery rhymes faster than the, the novel ones. Um, this is a very nice alternative explanations possible for that in terms of the, the rhyme or the meter and the traditional nursery rhymes being preferable or more memorable uh, than, the, than the, the novel ones. So that's where at the University of Northampton uh, we began to um, try and develop more sophisticated studies to test similar effects. So the medium we used for this was uh, Mandarin Chinese characters, uh, stimuli. Main rationale for this is because it's such a widely spoken uh, language, we would expect the, the morphic field to be, to be very strong. Uh, we're also interested in uh, individual covariates of success. Um, uh, we heard Annalisa speak uh, about the transliminality of Albon's concept. Uh, we're interested to see that whether that was uh, related to participants' uh, ex exhibition of the, the morphic resonance effect. So the design of the original study involved uh, a set of 20 stimuli, 10 of which were genuine Chinese characters that existed in the language and were widely used, whereas 10 were imitative. They were designed to look like uh, Chinese characters, but were made up for the study and didn't form part of the Chinese language and consequently hadn't been rehearsed by lots of people. In the presentation stage of the study, participants were shown five of the real characters, five of the imitative characters at the presentation stage. Um, it was displayed on a PowerPoint presentation, which looks something like this. Each was displayed for three seconds. And then there was a, a recognition or a judging phase where participants were shown all 20 characters and asked to indicate which ones they thought they'd seen during the presentation stage. So of these 20 characters, 10 are real, 10 are imitative, five 
real ones they would have seen before, five imitative ones they would have seen before, uh, ten that will be new to them. So the results from study one uh, across a participant sample of 60 did yield evidence supportive of Sheldrake's theory. So participants showed a, a preference for recognizing more of the genuine characters than the imitative ones. Uh, they also found a false memory effect. So for the characters they hadn't been exposed to, they erroneously suggested that they had seen more of the genuine characters than the imitative ones. In terms of the individual difference covariates, translimity was found to be positively correlated with the main headline morphic resonance effect, uh, but not for the false memory effect. Uh, this is where I came into the picture, and this is usually when the uh, nice supportive results tend to go away. Uh, I was very satisfied that the uh, results of study one were consistent with Rupert Sheldrake's theory, but were not a confirmation of it. And I had some concerns about the methodological approach, particularly around the generation of the imitative stimuli and whether they were uh, equivalent to the, to the genuine Chinese characters, uh, and also the lack of randomization in how the um, stimuli were presented to participants. So if you recall the, the recognition sheet you, sh you saw previously, the characters were presented in a fixed order, which could just be capturing people's kind of spatial preferences for where they like to note things on pieces of paper. Uh, so I generated, uh, put together a, a piece of software to automate the process uh, and to ensure more thorough randomization and used a more systematic way of producing the, uh, the stimuli. So that systematic method involved looking at the structural characteristics of Chinese characters. Chinese characters are composed of a core component, which is either referred to as a radical or a head component, which contains a specific number of strokes which are derived from a finite set of strokes. Chinese characters are then completed with the, additional, uh, with the addition of extra strokes to, to make um, the, the large number of Chinese characters which exist in the language. So using these structural, structural properties, we're able to generate imitative characters which contain the same core component, the same head component on a radical, and were matched also for the level of complexity or the total number of strokes within the character. So if we take one particular example, um, this is a radical head component which contains uh, four strokes. And in the case here, the genuine character translates as totem pole contains an additional three strokes, whereas this imitative character contains the same radical and the same number of additional strokes but has no meaning in the Chinese language. The availability of a larger number of stimuli allowed us to create three conditions. In the first condition, participants were shown the genuine character. In the second condition, the imitative counterpart. And in the third condition, neither of the, the, the stimulus pairs were, were shown to participants. So the program allowed everything to be automated, including the instructions. Data collection in terms of the individual difference covariates were also integrated into the software, which eliminate, eliminated the potential for human error in data collection and data entry that was uh, evident in study one, or possible in study one. Character presentation looked like this, again, for the same amount of time as in study one. We also introduced a distractor task into study two. The rationale for this was to try to um, inhibit people's memories or diminish people's memories to try to amplify the false memory effect which was reported in, in study one. So uh, they were asked to, to do something else and this is kind of the pinnacle of my career as a novice programmer in putting together a, a computer version of scissors, paper, stone or rock, paper, scissors as you know, may know in the States. Um, and this just distracted people from rehearsing what they'd just seen uh, with, the, with the aim of diminishing their, their memory for, for the characters. The recognition stage in this study took the form of presenting the stimulus, uh, stimuli in pairs for the match pairs. Participants were asked to select which one they thought they, re they recalled seeing, indicate how confident they felt within that, uh, uh, or alternatively to indicate that they didn't think they'd seen either of the two characters previously. Um, 
And the results did go away. So here we saw no um, effect, no headline morphic resonance effect. So there was no preference for the uh, genuine characters over the imitative characters. Uh, however, we did find when neither of the characters were presented, it was actually the imitative characters that uh, participants showed a preference for. And the individual difference covariance we looked at were, again, transliminality and openness to experience, uh, and there was no relationship found there. So that leads us on to study three, which is ongoing. And study three, we're, design, we're, we're intending to um, account for the inconsistencies or to identify why, why they were. So it could be that the new method we introduced for study two uh, reduced the, any artifacts or, which were inherent in study one. Um, maybe the theory is bunk and we, it just uh, wasn't being captured properly in study one. It could be my fault, it could be an experimental effect. Uh, so we introduced uh, some new research assistants to collect the data in study three. Or it could be that the differences we applied to study, uh, study two no longer tapped into the effect as study one was doing. Um, so the uh, study three is now using stimuli from both study one and study two to compare the effect and using a range of different study methods. So uh, a range of different uh, judging methods rather. So I'm pretty much out of time, but I'll just show you what the uh, three judging methods are. So we have the pairwise presentation as per study two, the setwise presentation as per study one, and uh, a novel element for this study is an individual presentation of the characters. So we are at about a quarter way through collecting data uh, so far. As things stand, findings are pretty much consistent with study two, unsupportive of uh, Sheldrake's theory. But there is uh, an unusual interaction between, uh, in, in at least two of the conditions, between the uh, presentation of the character and the character type. So when um, one of the characters is displayed, participants are showing a preference for the uh, genuine symbol, but when neither are displayed, the preference is for the, the imitative counterpart. Um, so we've got um, some way to go before we're up to 40 participants per condition, uh, and that's where we are currently. So thanks for listening, and welcome any comments or questions.